Go in your Bible. Go to Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to jump in today. But I am excited about Zoe Conference 2022. Can you believe it? It's back. After a two-year hiatus, we are back August 11th and 12th. Three years, August 11th and 12th. Make sure you mark your calendar. Those dates are secured. You are going to be at the Ebell Theater here in L.A. And uh, just what a lineup. Are you kidding me? We got Rich Jr. coming back. We got Steven Chandler from the East Coast. From Maverick City Music, Naomi Rain. We got Anna Golden, one of my favorite singers right now, and Aiden King. So let's clap for our guests that are coming. Get registered. Sign yourself up. Sign your cousin up, who I refer to oft, often. Everybody has a cousin that needs Jesus and uh, a co-worker. But make sure you get registered. Sign up. It's going to be fantastic. Does that sound good? Okay, we're talking today. We're in part two of a new series called Rebuilding the real you. I don't know what you've gone through. I don't know what you've faced. But a lot of times through trauma, drama, daddy and mama, a lot of time through circumstance and pain, the real you gets eroded away. The real you through problems, situations, circumstance, relational fallout. A lot of times because of our own decisions, the real you, because of sin, erodes away. I want to talk together about how do we real be, rebuild the real you. Which, by the way, the real you is the Jesus you. The real you is not the mean you. It's not, it's, it's not the one that needs Chick-fil-A every day. The re, who am I preaching to? Every Sunday you, you, you feel the need to get Chick-fil-A. But the real you is not the person that indulges or the person of the flesh. The real you is actually the spiritual you, the Jesus you. That is the real you of your life. And I want to encourage you that God, by his power, now in your own strength, you cannot rebuild the real you. But the Bible teaches us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So in your own strength, you will never rebuild your life. In your own power, you can never forgive that person. In your own ability, there's no way you can get out of your addiction. But through Christ, you can rebuild the real you. And this is the you you want to be. You want to be kind. You want to be generous. You want to serve God. You want to be happy. You want the Lakers to win. Fill the ghost. That's the real you. The real you is not losing their mind. The real you doesn't remember what happened in Vegas. That's not the real you. The real you is the Jesus you. You have been created by God for God. You, this is exciting stuff. And once you start to tap in to God's plan for your life, you discover there's destiny on you. There's potential on your life. There is a hope and a future. Listen, the events of your life cannot define you. People who have come against you cannot define you. God's plans and purposes are greater than anything that's ever come against you. And we've got to rebuild that person, that confidence, that excitement, that purpose, that passion. We've got to rebuild that person because that's the person God wants to see. But let's be honest, that's the person you want to see. So Nehemiah, by the way, Nehemiah, let me just give you some context. Nehemiah is, is perfectly placed by God for this story. Let me just say this about your life. God has strategically placed you where you are. It is no circumstance. There is no happenstance. It is no coincidence that you are where you are. You have been purposely by heaven placed where you are for such a time as this. You, let me just say it to you this way. You're in the right place. At the right time to do the right thing. If God wanted you somewhere else, he would have moved you already. If God wanted you to do something else, he would have told you already. But you are in the right place at the right time to do the right thing. Come on, clap if you're excited. God's in control today. 
The Bible says the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Yesterday I was preaching in Missouri to 8,000 men in an arena. Fantastic experience. Whenever I go to Missouri, I have to get ribs. I think Missouri's got some of the best ribs in the world. When I stood up at the counter yesterday, I knew exactly what I wanted. I just ordered, this is the ribs I like. This is how many I need. This is the sauce I'm looking for. Can I just tell you, when it comes to your life, God has ordered your steps. This is where I want you. This is what I want you to do. This is who I want you to be aligned with. Come on, anybody excited today? God is in control. <laughs> Nehemiah is placed by God. Similar to the story of Esther and Mordecai, who chronologically, listen, Nehemiah happens actually just right after Esther. So you have uh, an example where Esther was strategically placed, Nehemiah in the same way. He has favor with the king. Nehemiah hasn't been around Jerusalem in 12 years. After 12 years' time, it just so happens because of business he travels by way of Jerusalem. When he comes by Jerusalem, he sees the walls of Jerusalem have been torn down. Further breaking his heart, it's not just that walls are shattered, it's that the people of God aren't living for God. He sees that they've exchanged God's plan for their own plan, God's ways for their ways. He becomes distraught. He becomes overwhelmed. He cannot believe the, what he's seeing in his life. He's like, I don't know what, what's going on here, but I've got to do something about it. Write down today's title. I want to preach a message. It's called, You Don't Have to Be Great to Start. I want to tell somebody today, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. Listen, I don't know what you're up against. I don't know what you're facing. Listen, you don't have to be some high, lofty professional. You don't have to be the smartest person in the group. You don't have to have all the resources or money. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to have fortune. You just got to start. You just got to start rebuilding your life. You don't have to be great to start, but you got to start to be great. Nehemiah's like, I don't know what's going on here. This is crazy. The walls are torn down. Everybody's not serving God. He's overwhelmed. Write down point number one today. He's taking assessment. Look at Nehemiah chapter one, verse three. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and repro reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was. When I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Write down point number one today. He was taking assessment. See, what I think about your life is that we've got to get honest for a second. We've got to take an honest assessment of where we're at. Nehemiah didn't walk by the walls and walk by the people and go like, no, it's good. We're going to be fine. They're just, they're getting around. Ah, these walls, they used to be awesome. But you know, times are changing. Culture's shifting. Things are different. No, he sat down and he wept because he, he knew, I got to be honest about this. This is earth shattering. This is heartbreaking. This is breaking my heart. This is not what I want to see. This is not what I want in my life. Can I just encourage you that you need to take an honest assessment of your life? The first thing that God asks man in the history of the Bible, in the book of Genesis is, where are you? I wonder if God asks you that today. Where are you? Could you answer? If God asks you, how are you? Could you answer honestly? I love being with 8,000 men in Missouri yesterday. And I was poking fun at the guys going, if you ask a guy, how are you? Every guy is always good. <laughs> and if you ever love somebody, you, you follow up and ask them again, no, how you really doing? And they will give you the same answer, good. I've never met a guy that was like, how you doing? Not good. That's at the women's conference. <laughs> Ladies can't wait to be asked. Oh, just... But you're not good. You don't know where you're at. And things aren't going the way you want them to. 
And maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your business. Maybe it's some relationships. Maybe it's the country. Maybe it's a situation. But we got to get honest about where we are. I love Psalm 51, verse 6. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Listen, if you can't be honest with God, you'll never be honest with another. If you can't be honest with yourself, you'll never be honest with a friend. You've got to start being honest with God. Start being honest with yourself. The walls are burnt down. Things are going bad. Come on, anybody glad that God is not intimidated by your frustration? He is not put off by your reality. He is not alarmed by what you're going through. He is seated on the throne. He knows what happened. He was there when it happened. He cares about you. He wants you to talk to him about the good, bad, and the ugly. Nehemiah, he saw the wall and he saw the city. And he's like, I, this is too, I need a moment. I got to sit down and I got to cry because I thought life was going to go great. I thought this w- job was going to work out. I thought things were going to be easier. I thought this was going to be an awesome season. But I got to be honest. This is not what I, I planned. This is not what I wanted. This is not the situation. This is not the dream. I got to make an honest assessment about where I'm at. I want to encourage you today. You don't ever have to play games with God. God knows you and he loves you. He loves you in the good days and the bad days. He loves you when you're doing well and you're doing bad. If you're ever unfaithful, he'll still be faithful. He is a generous God. He's an unconditional love God. He is, an, he is a committed God. Somebody thank him today that he is for you. Who can be against you? <laughs> Nehemiah sits down. He's like, I just need a minute. Well, why? This is not good. When was the last time that you were honest with somebody and said, I just want to let you into my life? I'm not doing good. I'm not feeling okay. I didn't think this is the life I was, this has been harder than I want to admit. This is, I need help. I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray with me. The first step if you're ever going to rebuild your life, is you got to take an assessment of your life. It's like when you walk in the mall and you walk in and you know there's so many stores. you got to find that kiosk and find that little little center and you got to find out on the map, you are here. Do you know where you are? Because if you don't know the season you're in, you don't know what action to take. God wants to identify and give you an assessment, give you an assessment so you can with accuracy rebuild your life. Clap if you're thankful that the Holy Spirit will lead you to be honest. I don't think you're a liar. I just don't know if you're honest. See, most of us, your struggle is not lying. Most of us, our struggle is concealing. We want to save face. We want everything. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm not, everything's fine. It's not fine. You're not okay. So let's just be honest about the assessment. And the second one, right down number two, is that he's in great agony. Because sometimes when you're honest about your assessment, it doesn't leave you going like, yeah, killing it. Knew it. That's why you don't like to look at your bank statement. And that's why you don't like the dentist. No one's ever gotten to their Amex bill and been like, killing it. You're always like, Oh, wow, she's in trouble. <laughs> that was a good one. Now, sometimes it's okay to let your assessment lead to agony. The Bible actually teaches us that there is a repentance that leads to death and a repentance that leads to life. A repentance that leads to death goes, I've taken assessment, but I refuse to change. But a a repentance that leads to life says, I've seen the assessment. I watch the walls. I see the burning fire. I see the things that's going on, and I refuse to live this life, and I'm going to make a change about it, and I've got some resolve about it, and i got some back. Come on, clap today. If you're saying, I refuse to live this, I've been called to be the tail. I'm called to be the head. I'm not called to suffer. I'm called to live for the Savior. I'm not called for mediocrity. I'm called to give them a clap and a praise today. If you know that God has a plan for you, I'm not settling off the assessment of just knowing. Listen, the Bible says the good that a man knows he ought to do and doesn't do sense. 
See, you think sin is Vegas. Sin is knowing I should do something about this, but I refuse to do anything. No, I got to have some assessment that leads to my agony. So Nehemiah is strategically placed. He's got favor with the king. This is the first time that he's ever come in front of this Persian king. He's, he's serving in Persia. He's got a heart for Jerusalem. So he goes to in front of the king. First time he's ever showed up in front of the king and been sad. All the other times he showed up at work, he's happy. All the other times he's got his hair perfect. All the other times he's got a piece of Orbitz gum and his breast smells good. This is the first time he ever walked in the office and the king looked and went, my man, you good? You all right? I've never seen you sad before. I've never seen you down before. You're usually up. What's going on, Nehemiah? Watch what Nehemiah says to the king. I love this in chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2 says, Therefore, the king said to me, Why is your face sad? Since you are not sick, this is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. And I said to the king, May the king live forever, but why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire? Sir, I, I, I hate to say this, but why shouldn't I be sad? I've got things going on in my world and in my soul and in my home that are devastating. So I've just got to be honest for a second. It's a little embarrassing, King, to be honest here at work, but I'm not good. And I know that usually I am good, but I found in my assessment that I'm unhealthy. I found in my assessment that I've got sin patterns. I found in my assessment that I'm bitter. I found in my assessment I'm broken. I found in my assessment I got things going on. I'm not good. See, are you willing to go from assessment to agony? Because if you keep blowing by your assessment, you'll never feel the pain that leads to change. The repentance that leads to death says, I've seen it and I'm good. You shouldn't be good with some of the things going on in your world. This is not okay what's happening to you. This is not okay what you're experiencing. There needs to be change. You're called by God for great things. You're called by God to live in holiness. You're called to live in purity. You're called to live in generosity. Clap today if you're happy that I'm my, my assessment is leading to a little bit of repentance that leads to change. So you got to go from assessment to agony. And the agony is, is not God being mad at you. See, some of us, we don't ever want to feel bad. And I saw, I, this most people, most people think, see, I, I'm good with God because I'm a good person. I'm a good person and God loves me because I'm a good person. By the, Jesus was not sent by the Father to help bad people become good people. Jesus was sent by the Father to take dead people and make them alive. Good people don't get into heaven. People that believe in Jesus get into heaven. We don't like to feel bad. I don't know about you, but I got things that I want to deal with in my life that are not bad things. They're things that could lead to death. They could destroy your future. They could destroy your marriage. They could destroy your home. They could destroy your mind. They could destroy your morals. They could destroy your money. They could destroy your spirit. Don't you ever get involved in stuff in the assessment. Just go, I'm just going to keep floating. No, I got some agony because I want some repentance. So he, he, he takes the assessment. And he's like, I got to be honest. We got no money. We got no job. Our pets' heads are falling off. No one under the age of 26 laughed at that joke. And if you did, you're just so kind. He just laughed to laugh. Because it was a dumb and dumber reference. He takes an honest assessment. And he's like, I, 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 can't, I can't believe this is not in a million years that I dreamed this is, this is, this is going to be what we face. And I, and, and, and I, I got to be honest, King, I, I, I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I've got my... My, my, uh, my outfit on today, and I, I, I'm doing my best, but I'm, I'm struggling. How, how, could I, how could I not be, sir? The, the place where my father is, the place that I love, the place that is near and dear to my heart is in shambles. The place that I care about is suffering, and I'm, I'm not good today. And he pivots from king to true king. And he goes from assessment to agony, to agreement. He goes to a higher power than the king of Persia, and he actually comes before God. He says, God, this is, this is, a king can't only solve this. 
God can solve this. And he reminds God of an agreement that God's made. You need to know this about God. He is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. We serve a God that loves contracts. That's why I love when we're talking about kingdom builders. We talk to you about getting on that website, make a commitment. It's not a commitment with Zoe. It's a commitment with God because God loves contracts. God has made a contract with you and I. Nehemiah remembers a contract God made. He reminds God. Watch what he says here. Go back to Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 8. It says, remember, I pray the word, God, that you commanded your servant Moses. I'm reminding you, if you are unfaithful, you told us, if we are unfaithful, that you will scatter us among the nations. But you said, if you return to me and you keep my commandments and you do them, though some of you were cast out to the furthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and I will bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. He come, Nehemiah comes before God. He said, you told us that if we turn our back on you, that we'd be scattered and we face sorrow. But you told us that if we repented, you told us if we got right, you told us that if we came back, you would heal us, you would deliver us, you would help us, and you would free us. Anybody thankful today that God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God? I don't know if you've ever signed a contract. When you're early on in life signing contracts, you just sign. This is like when you go rent a car. I've never read the rental. I just, I can't sign fast enough. They could be asking for my first child and my savings account. Doesn't matter. Just, I want out of this airport now. But when you make a real contract that has to do with like your business or your intellect or your future, you get lawyers involved like Jake. And you try and go through that thing for any clause, for anything. It's like, oh, no, no, we don't, we're not signing up for that. We're not agreeing to those terms. Oh, you, you want what percent? You crazy for that. You want me to show up how many times? Are you crazy for that? Because you go through with a fine tooth comb of just making sure I agree to these terms. God made an agreement with you. And the terms are unfair because they're so good to us and not always good to him. They favor us and they don't even favor God. Watch God's new covenant, new agreement he makes in Jeremiah 31. But this is the new agreement that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people and no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. God has made agreements with you that maybe you're not even aware of today. Every time you see a rainbow, it's an agreement God made with us that he'll never flood the earth again. Jesus represents the fact that God made an agreement with us that no longer our parents have to teach us faith. But on the tablets of our heart, God has written his love all over us. God made an agreement that I will remember your sins no more. Your spouse might keep record of your sins. I just, the Holy Spirit led me. I am but an orator under the inspiration and the mandate of heaven. But God keeps no record of your sins. God's made agreements with you. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins, and I'll heal their land. Can you remind yourself today of the agreements God has made with you. They're called the promises of God. God promises to be a provider. He promises to be a protector. God promises to come through. God promises his love. I just love Nehemiah because he's like, I'm, I'm devastated by this assessment. I'm overwhelmed and I have no hope outside of you. And so I make a commitment before you and God. I just thank you, God, that you made an agreement with us. You told us that if we tried to get our lives right, you'd help us. So you have no shot to get your life right outside of the agreement God's made with you. To give you his power and to give you his spirit and to give, his, give you his love. And I love that he went from assessment, he went to agony, he went to agreement, and he started rebuilding those walls. 
And as he started to rebuild those walls, you got to watch out for something in your life. Because it happened to Nehemiah and it'll happen to you. All of a sudden, the attitudes started to rise up. Write down number four, attitudes. See, because you and I, we think like, man, this is awesome. I'm going to take an assessment and I'm going to find out what's wrong in my life. And I'm going to just, I'm going to get real. I'm going to get raw. I'm going to get authentic. I'm going to get in my journal. I'm going to write it down on my notes. And I'm going to take this assessment and it's going to be so raw. Never been so raw. And I, it's just like, even if it's hard, I'm going to cry my eyes out, but I'm going to pucker up and get going. And I'm just going to get, just going to go for it. And it, listen, when you start rebuilding your life, just a heads up, the forewarning, there's going to be people that come against you. Because there's people in your life that are benefiting off your brokenness. There are people in your life that go, we don't want you to change. These broken down walls and this burning fire, we love to hang out with you. You're my drinking buddy. You're my partying buddy. You're my, you're my critical buddy. You're my gossip buddy. You're my go out at night party buddy. I don't want you to change. You change. You're a threat to me. We've been living this way 12 years. Why are you going to change now? Come on, clap today if you're thankful. Just as a forewarning that there's not every going to be, not everybody's going to be for you. In Nehemiah's case, it was some guys named Sanballat and Tobiah. You know you from the devil when you name Sanballat. <laughs> Who names their children Sanballat? That's awful. Look at Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 10. When Sanballat, the horno knight, that's just terrible, and the Tobi, the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very upset and angry that anyone would come to look after the interests of the people of Israel. Watch as it goes further. Verse chapter 4, Sambalat was very angry, and when he learned that they were rebuilding the wall, he flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a new sacrifice? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and, and, and charred ones at, at that? Do, do you know there's people in your life going, who do you think you are? You think you're better than me? You think I don't know what you used to do? You think I don't know the real, I know the real you. Oh, you in church acting holy. I remember what we did last summer. See, you have to understand that there's going to be attitudes that come against you. Not, listen, God is for you, but not everybody else. God is in your corner, not everybody else. And you're going to have to be okay with critics. You're going to have to be okay with not all your family maybe being on your side. Not all your friends making the change. Remember, in life, there's three types of friendship. There's people in your life you are for the same thing. There's other people in your life you are against the same thing. But there's only a little few people that are actually for you. See, most of us get it twisted. We go, I thought we were friends. No, 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 no. You're not friends. They're just for the same thing you're for. I thought we were closer. No, you're just against the same thing that they are against. There's a few people in your corner that are saying, I'm with you heart and soul. And I can recognize, thank you for letting me into your life. And thank you for letting me. I didn't know that these walls have been broken this long. I didn't know you've been addicted that long. I didn't know you've been living with that mental torment for that long. I didn't know that there's been burning fires in your life. Thank you for letting me in on your agony. But I wanna let you, I wanna let you know that there's more people that are for you than against you. I wanna let you know you're doing better than you think you are. Don't you listen to the sand ballots in your life. Don't you, li don't you, don't you listen to the naysayers. Don't you listen to the haters from the bleachers talking about you're never going to change. You're never going to rebuild. Who do you think you are? I know the family you grew up in. I know the area you're from. I know who you are. Who are you kidding? There's no, there's no way you can do it. Don't you listen to the attitude that is against you. Attitude is everything. So let's get the attitude of Christ. Let's get the attitude of faith. Let's get the attitude of miracles. Let's get the attitude of I can do all things through Christ. Christ who strengthens me. Give him a clap right there in your house. Give him a clap in the chat. If you're saying, greater is he that is within me than he that is within the world. <laughs> Worship team, come join me. I just love this because listen, your life rises and falls on attitude. And listen, listen, your attitude is your altitude. You will never live a life better than your attitude. So I love Nehemiah. Nehemiah's like, Sam Ballot, you can go back to wherever you're from. We rebuild it. 
<laughs> you against me? I got people that are with me. Say what you want on social media. Say what you want in the cubicle. You can laugh at me around the dinner table. You can throw gifts around on the group chat. It's not swaying me. I know what's wrong. I know what God's called me to do. I know I'm under construction. I know I'm a work in progress. I don't have all the answers. I don't have everything figured out. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I press hold to take hold of that which God has for me. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but I felt like telling somebody, don't you listen and don't you lie down to the critics of your life. There's going to be people that don't understand and they don't need to understand. All they need to know is that you made an assessment and out of agony you made a decision and you've got resolve and you've got conviction and you've got a commitment to say, I'm going to raise my family in the ways of God. I'm going to build my life to do the God stuff. I'm going to serve Jesus. I'm going to live for a kingdom that is not of this world. I'm going to heaven and I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm getting my life right. Right. Give them a praise today if you're grateful. Who cares what they say? If you live by their praise, you'll die by their criticism. Nehemiah says, I can give two nickels what you think, man. Do you realize my dad's buried there? Do you realize this is my destiny? Do you realize for such a time as this, God spoke to my heart. I got favor with the king of Persia. God's called me to do. Who cares what you think? Stop living for the opinions of others. I was telling the men at the men's conference, women have FOMO. Fear of missing out. But the men have FOPO. Fear of other people's opinions. You'll never rebuild the real you caring what other people think. You'll never rebuild the real you worried about what this, that, or the other person is saying behind your back. Does it matter what they say or does it matter what you've assessed? Last one, number five, write it down. This is the last thing Nehemiah had and it's the last thing that you'll need in your life. <laughs> you need absolute. You need some resolve. You need some moxie. You need some backbone. See, they rebuild the walls because they had conviction. They weren't wishy-washy. They weren't going, I'm building my life off feelings. No, they were like, we're building our life on faith. Watch what it says. Worship team, come join me. Nehemiah chapter 2. Sorry, chapter 4, verse 6. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. For the people had a mind to work. Verse 16. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor, and the leaders were behind all those house of Judah. Those who built on the wall, watch this, get a visual. Those who built on the wall, and those who carried the burdens, they loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction, and with the other hand they held a weapon. <laughs> with one hand they're building, and on the other hand they're protecting. I want to tell you today, it's not going to be easy. It's not for the faint of heart. If you want to be great, not everybody can be great. Greatness doesn't happen in a day. It happens daily. And they said, you know what? Every day we got a mind to work. And we're going to show up. And even if we got to hold our building utensils in this hand and our fighting utensils in this hand, we're going to do what God's called us to do. Because I know that I know that God's called me to do something. And I've got to have some sacrifice. I've got to have some devotion. Clap today if you're willing to pay the price. To step into what God has for your life not going to happen overnight it's not going to be easy for everybody but they have the mind to do the work I want to ask you do you have the mindset after your assessment and after your agony to build your life because listen it's going to look like this I'm a single mom showing up going to work 
getting my kids to practice and at night when they're in bed I'm meeting with my counselor and I'm reading the books and I'm asking before God will you heal me and will you deliver me and tomorrow I'm gonna get up I'm gonna go to work I'm gonna take my kids to school come on clap today if you're willing to have some absolute have some resolve say I'm gonna do it whatever it takes just love that Nehemiah saw the wall and the fire cried his eyes out and then got to work (laughs) the decisions that you make today will determine the destiny you experience tomorrow it's a decision I'm not willing to live in this chaos and live in this issue and live in this secret sin any longer I'm past crying about it. I got a mind to work this thing. I want to tell you today, you can do all things through Christ. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And there's no wall that's broken. And there's no thing that's burning that God can't touch. There's no thing in your life that God isn't bigger than and isn't stronger than. And whatever you've experienced and whatever you've gone through, it's not stronger than the love of Jesus. Jesus is better. Jesus is bigger. Jesus is stronger. Jesus is greater. Come on, clap today in your house. Clap today in the church if you're grateful that God will give you the power, the moxie, and the ability to rebuild.